Welcome back to your weekly dopamine. Here's another video from Discovery Science. By the way, how dare you put science in your channel name? The only way that would be acceptable is if your channel name was not science. Okay, I want to talk about the bad design argument, or you could call it the argument from bad design. This is the argument that says that actually if you look at life in detail, although if you stand back and say, oh, there's a lot of things about life that look as though it was intelligent, intelligently designed, if you look at the details, you can see hints that it wasn't, in fact, intelligently designed, that it was cobbled together by something that couldn't see what it was trying to make. So yeah, I think this argument is a pretty important one. There are just way too many mistakes from the human body design that it's not very correct to say that some sort of infinite intelligence created it. Okay, if God were limited in some way, maybe he wasn't all-knowing, then yeah, your position can't be debunked this way. Unfortunately, because you start with the premise that God is literally infinite in everything including intelligence, then we have some problems. You know, I'm surprised there aren't any Christians, or at least not that I've heard of, that believes in God but believes he's not omnipotent. Maybe there are some out there that I'm not aware of. A much more honest position in my opinion. Okay, so back on topic, there are thousands of things we could sit down and name that shows the flaw in the human body. Genetic diseases count as one example each, and there's an estimate of 6,000 of them, at least that we know of. And you, you can see why if you think that life was put together by a blind watchmaker, not an intelligent watchmaker, you would want to argue this way. I already know how he's going to try to debunk this. He's going to say, oh, it looks like a flaw in the human body, but it's actually not. And sure, maybe you can do that for some of them, but certainly not all of them, and certainly not for any genetic diseases out there. For example, the appendix was originally thought to be useless, but it turns out it has a role in immunity. For those, sure, you can come up with something. However, when we get to some of the less obvious ones, such as the path of the laryngeal nerve, or like I said earlier, genetic diseases, then it's harder to defend. And I haven't seen any creationists respond to this yet. Why did God make cystic fibrosis a thing? Why did God make Huntington's, Down syndrome, color blindness, type 1 diabetes, Marfan syndrome, hemophilia, etc, etc? There's just way too many to name. Seriously, there's no advantage to pretty much all of these disorders, so feel free to try and debunk them all. Now there's two different strands of this kind of argument. One is really the broken design argument, and the other is the inept or incompetent design argument. So one looks at things like cancer and birth defects, all kinds of things that go wrong that cause death and misery, and asks whether a designing intelligence, whether God would have made life so that all of these things go wrong. And the other one says that actually the, the details of life suggest that something other than an intelligence put it together, that there's ineptness or strangeness in the design that no designer would have used. Okay, if you want to categorize it that way, then sure, it makes sense to me. The first suggests that God may have evil intentions, while the second suggests God is incompetent. Both disprove the biblical portrayal of God. I suppose the ones I talked about, genetic diseases, falls into the second category, so let's see what you have to say about them. There are really two different arguments, and the this one over here, the one that argues that, that there's broken things and calls into question God's motives, if you will, for making life, that's a different argument because it's not actually arguing that God didn't make life or that life wasn't intelligently designed. It's just calling into question motives or calling into question why it would look like this if he did make it. Sure, it calls into question on God's motives, but that doesn't exempt you from answering the argument. I honestly think this category is the stronger argument, but since you're not going to address it, then we might as well move on. The other one is more correct as an argument against, or is more plausible, at least superficially. Okay, so a, a famous person who's put forward arguments along these lines, and a lot of people have done this, but Neil deGrasse Tyson gave a lecture. I'm not sure when he gave this lecture, but if you go to YouTube and search for Neil deGrasse Tyson stupid design, you'll find a five-minute video clip from a lecture and he throws up on the screen there stupid design, and he talks for about five minutes on what he thinks are the key examples of stupid design. There's too many of them for me to respond to all of them, but I wanted to pick out a couple of them just to give you a flavor of how easy it is to refute or to dismiss these arguments. It's five minutes. I don't know why you couldn't have responded to the whole thing. That's kind of the point, right? In order to defend your position, you have to refute everything thrown at you. You can't just respond to a couple of them and think you've won the battle, because even if one of the arguments against you is true, then your position falls apart, and that's how science works. But whatever, let's have a look. He doesn't play any of the clips directly from the video, so there might be some cherry picking or straw mans. The first thing, if you look at the video, to notice is he's not talking as a philosopher to a bunch of philosophers. He's not being a thinking person who's trying to convince other critical thinking people. He's instead being more a stand-up comedian delivering a, a stand-up comedy 
routine to a bunch of people who clap and enjoy his viewpoint. Yeah, I mean, I assume he's talking to a bunch of atheists here. It's important to know your audience. For example, I'm speaking to an audience that probably watches me on a regular basis, so they most likely agree with my viewpoints. So I can make jokes here and there, but if I were talking to a room full of creationists, I would write my scripts completely differently. That being said, sure, maybe he could have directed his presentation more towards a general audience. Perhaps his goal at the end was to entertain, so you can't blame him for that. At the end of the day, that's one of my major purposes too. And that signals to you, if you look at the video, that probably this isn't going to be the most uh, compelling intellectual content. Poisoning the well right off the bat. Good, good. One of the first things that he says is that if you put life almost anywhere within the volume of this universe, it would die instantly. Okay, and of course that's true. If you put us in outer space, we would suffocate. If you put us in the middle of the sun, we'd burn to death. If you put us in the middle of the earth, we'd be crushed and, and burned to death. Of course that's true, but it's not a very compelling argument. He wants to say that because most of the volume of the universe is not conducive to life, therefore you can't say that this universe was designed for life. But you could apply that logic equally to, say, a roller coaster and say that if you put humans most places on the structure of a roller coaster, it would be very dangerous for them and they could very likely die and therefore roller coasters were not designed for humans. But that's complete nonsense. They were designed for humans, and they were designed for humans to be in the seat with the harness down to hold them in. That's not a correct analogy. First of all, if a human was spawned in most areas of the roller coaster, you'd likely be fine, because you won't die if you spawn on the ground. Sure, if you spawn to like 50 meters in the air, then there will be a problem. Second of all, the argument stems from what the rest of the space is for. The space of the roller coaster that isn't the track itself is there because we need space to run the coaster. The empty space allows the ride to travel at high speeds throughout the area, but you can't make the coaster too tight for safety purposes. In other words, every area that isn't the track or the coaster itself is there to support the activity. Meanwhile, that is not the case for the universe. The universe is 99.999999% hostile and humans would die upon exposure. It serves no other purpose for human beings, unlike the empty spaces of the roller coaster. If we remove the rest of the universe except for, say, the solar system, then our everyday lives would essentially be the same. So what is the purpose of creating all that vastness? A better analogy than a roller coaster would be a fish in a puddle of water where the fish would think, hmm, this puddle of water was created by an intelligent being, specifically for me, and everywhere outside the puddle, aka the rest of the earth, was also created for me. And we all know that isn't the case, the puddle just happened to be there and the rest of the world is not there for the purposes of sustaining that fish. Take out everything but the puddle and ground that supports it and nothing would change for the fish. Now that is a better analogy. Another argument that Tyson puts forward um, in this five minute video, and one that he claims is his favorite argument, is the fact that we have, we eat and drink and breathe and speak through one opening, the mouth. And he claims that this is an example of stupid design because it's just asking for us to choke. Yep, it's a silly design. I mean, sure, there's the epiglottis, but that's like a bare minimum we can ask for. But it's really a very silly argument. Um, let's think about this a little more carefully than he did. What are the anatomical structures that we use to eat? It's the lips, it's the teeth, it's the palate, and the tongue. Those are all well designed for eating, right? But what are the anatomical structures that we use for speaking? It's the very same structures. It's the lips, it's the teeth, it's the palate, it's the tongue. The very same structures that are used for eating are used for speaking. And speaking requires air. We have to breathe to speak. We're expelling air as we speak. Okay, so I can see your argument, but you're just not being creative enough. Why not just have a second opening that can only expel air and also has those same structures? It still doesn't have to say why it has to be the same opening to do both activities. Or if you think even more outside the box, why even need chewing and eating at all? Why not make our digestive systems more powerful so that we can just swallow things whole like a snake? That would remove the need for a tongue and teeth, so that could be a second opening. You're just not being creative here, which is the problem. If God wanted to create our bodies to be perfect, then there wouldn't be a risk of choking to begin with. The fact that you can choke means the body cannot be considered perfect, and that means God, with infinite intelligence, was incompetent. So this is actually an example of elegant design. Designers, if you go and talk to de design engineers, it's considered to be very elegant design if you can use the same structures for two different purposes. That's not elegant design, that's lazy design. Deciding to reuse the same structure rather than designing a new one. Lazy, if you ask me. 
And in fact, if you look at causes of death among humans in America, there are statistics on this. Choking actually isn't in the top 10 causes of death. Number 10 is suicide, okay? So think about what a designer could have done if the main goal were to prevent death. They could have, the designer could have not given us a mind because it's a mind gone wrong, a mind gone depressed that leads to suicide. That's so vague and so false. It's not just a mind gone wrong. There are tons of reasons which can contribute to suicide, such as external stressors, or a big one, depression, which is an actual mental disease. So guess what? God could have just not created the mental disease. Some people just don't have the right amounts of neurotransmitters in their brain and that causes depression. Why make it so some people have that imbalance? It's so stupid. Design always involves the weighing of multiple objectives, and it always involves trade-offs. Completely disagree. You simply just cannot think outside of the box. Let's say there is a trade-off. In that case, God could literally rewrite biology and physics itself in order for there to not be a trade-off. In addition, you guys are the ones saying that the human body is perfect. If there are trade-offs, then by definition, it's impossible to be perfect. You can literally get anyone to design a better human body. It's easy. Just take out genetic diseases, mutations, birth defects, wisdom teeth, give us eyes in the back of our heads, improve our vision, smell, hearing, opposable thumbs on our feet, inability to become obese or nearsighted, flexibility, you know, some of the basics, and it's already better than what God has designed. 